celebrating and showcasing extraordinary people who are doing incredible things to make our world a better place. This is Close Up Television. I'm your host, Jim Masters. Thanks for joining us. On today's episode, we celebrate leadership coach, author, and keynote speaker, Dr. Mike Armour. For over 30 years, Dr. Armour has helped leaders and executives perfect their professional skills, attain peak performance, and discover new dimensions of satisfaction and fulfillment. As the founder of Strategic Leadership Development International, Dr. Armour knows firsthand the world of top-level decision-making. In his early 30s, he started a highly successful private school in California. By 37, he was one of the youngest college presidents in the United States. A year later, he was a Naval Reserve Commander, eventually retiring as a captain with nationwide management duties in the field of intelligence. During his 35 years of naval service, he was decorated three times for his groundbreaking work in computerizing the naval intelligence community. For five years, he served as CEO of an international humanitarian organization operating in Eastern Europe and Asia. Later, he established and managed Leader Perfect Leadership Training Programs in the emerging economies of East Africa. A successful author in leadership and other fields, Dr. Armour is currently published in over 20 languages. His writing and coaching are marked by an astute understanding of personal behavior, organizational dynamics, and the process of cultural change. He has also taught MBA courses on coaching and mentoring for the Texas Women's University School of Management. Dr. Armour also serves on the Board of Trustees for York College in Nebraska and even ran for Congress in 2002. A fascinating life journey he's been on. To learn more about Dr. Armour's incredible work, serving more than 60 industries, coaching over 700 executives, managers, and entrepreneurs, and to learn how he's trained thousands of leaders on four continents, he joins me in the close-up television studio today for this exclusive interview. Dr. Armour, thank you very much for joining us here at the Close-Up mm -hmm. Television Studio. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's my pleasure to be with you. I'm looking forward to the conversation. You know, the work you do is so fascinating, and I mentioned in the introduction your extraordinary background is so varied. You've had quite a life's journey, and you mm -hmm. continue to. I'm fascinated by your work and can't wait to break it down for our viewers. Um, one of the things that really fascinates me when you're dealing with leadership because you know the role of leaders has changed mm -hmm. greatly hasn't it mm -hmm. um, it used to be that boss up in the ivory tower sort of looking over everything but now I think leaders are realizing that there needs to be more engagement with the staff engagement with those who are working in the on the front lines to put the product together or to get, to get the voice the mission the vision out to the mm -hmm. public and there seems to be this understanding of a more empathetic approach to leadership. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, in part, it is an evolution that has been necessitated by the change in the workforce. You have to keep in mind that our concepts of management developed in an era in which most workers were uneducated. They didn't even have a high school educated, uh, education. They went to work in factories or in some other industrial capacity when they were teenagers. As a result, you had a workforce that was not really equipped to take re responsibilities that they were individually going to be accountable for and to implement them. So there was a lot of direction in order to keep things on track. With the conclusion of the Second World War, the United States and Western Europe both put a real emphasis on making university education available to the entire public. And with that, we started developing today's white-collar workforce and today's very skilled technical workforce who are not uh, receptive to being told what to do because they have a real confidence that they have the tools, the know-how, and the wisdom to take a ball and run with it. Mm. As a result, that reality has caused, uh, caused managers and leaders to realize the multiplication effect they get if they are more empowering. And to be empowering, then they have to be encouraging and motivational, even inspirational in the case of leaders. The other thing is that the people who were really leaders all along, 
were themselves more involved with people and team builders. That's what set them apart. When I first began training in leadership, that, and I was in my 20s at the time, there were very few books available on leadership. Everything that was available was on management. So if you went into the Barnes & Noble equivalent of that day, you might find five or six books on the shelf on leadership, but you would find a wall filled with books on management. And there was good reason for that. We had just come out of the Second World War, which one can argue we won as much because we outmanaged the enemy as we outmaneuvered and outled the enemy. That is to say, our production capability in the United States was able to turn out more war material and more ammunition and get it to the battlefield faster than Germany, Italy, and Japan combined. Mm. And it was that management prowess on the home front coupled with the leadership on the battlefront mm. that allowed us to win the war. Well, those organizations that managed the home front right. now transition to a domestic economy and they take that same command and control approach that had gotten them through the war and put it into practice now producing things for the domestic economy. As a result of that, the fascination was with management, not with leadership. And it was only in the late 1980s that a couple or three pioneering books appeared looking longitudinally at management and particular managers uh, individually and discovered that as they traced why these managers stood out from other managers, it was because they had these qualities that today we call leadership. That then began this whole rethinking of what it means to be a leader as well as a manager. Obviously, having a strong team and a support system is crucial. What are some of the key elements to building a strong team, Doctor? One of the most important things is for the team itself to have uh, an, a sense of deep trust in one another. Mm. Uh, Patrick Lencioni, who's done the classic work on what makes teams dysfunctional, says that the first thing you've got to have is trust. And I guess one of the reasons I've resonated with that is because I had reached the same conclusion years before he published that book and had published my book on leadership and the power of trust, in which I had argued that if you were going to have a healthy culture, it had to be trust-based at the, at the, at the base. Um, the fact of the matter is, trust is probably the first social value that we as human beings had to develop. Now, there were other social traits that we had, but when you think about the era of the hunter-gatherer economies, yeah. the very primitive tribes, for a hunter to leave for two or three days a week to track down game, kill it, and bring it back, he had to trust that his family was going to be taken care of back at, at the village, that his property would be cared for back at the village. And so trust is the fundamental building block of all communities. And when it falls apart, communities fall apart. Well, teams have to collaborate. They have to be of one mind and one vision. And the trust allows them then to harmonize their efforts around that commonality because there will be times that they question one another's judgment. They have to trust the other person to make the right decision to carry out the right uh, set of priorities that are within the game plan, even if it's not quite what I would have expected them to do. The, one of the ways that I think about it is that <clears throat> there has to be in a team a unifying ethos. Now, that word ethos is the old Greek word that gives us our word ethic. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it doesn't mean ethic. Uh, what it means is a set of unifying principles that become the container in which we do things. And... In journalism classes in school, uh, any of us who took those courses were told that a story ought to answer five, five questions. Uh, who, when, where, why, and how. Okay? Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I look at it as something of an adaptation of that 
to explain the concept of a unifying ethos. That unifying ethos has to say, in effect, uh, this is what we do, this is why we do it, this is how we do it, this is who wins when we do it well, and this is when we will know that we've succeeded. And getting that ethos defined so that the culture is orchestrated around a common set of commitments in those line, along those lines is, is invaluable. Now then, there has to go with that trust open communication. Mm -hmm. Good teams never worry about over-communicating. Right. And team leaders never worry about over-communicating. In fact, uh, one professional uh, coach has said that unless your team is saying you've communicated the values of the organization too much, you probably haven't communicated it enough. That you've got to come back to it over and over and over again to keep people constantly reminded that this is what we're about. This is where we're going. In that open communication, which is now possible because of the trust, there has to be a high level of accountability. Not because we don't trust one another, but because we're all human. Right. And because we're human, we're going to slip up and forget to do things that we committed to do or get sloppy about something that we've t typically done professionally, but we got hurried today and so we, we really let some things slip. And we've got to have that kind of trust that allows us to call one another to task and to commend one another and build one another up when the uh, time is appropriate to keep the spirit high. Another thing that is vitally important for teams is that there be more we th talk than me talk. That this is a team right. that is doing this. And one of the reasons that teams are so important today is because the complexity of our technology and the complexity of the products we're developing is so great that no one person knows everything that needs to be known to make that happen. Right. A simple way to illustrate this in historical terms is we know who, who in, uh, invented the airplane. Who invented the space shuttle? Mm. Okay. Right. We know who invented the telephone. Uh, you know, who invented the Internet? <laughs> yeah. True, right. The, the, right. the technology simply outpaces now the ability of any person to know everything that needs to be known to bring a product to market in a way that is going to make it uh, attractive to the buyer and hold up as it should under uh, the usage it's put to and which will allow it to, uh, to age with the market and not become obsolete overnight. So trust building and maintaining that trust really is essential for executive and entrepreneur. It, 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 any place people are working together, there's got to be trust. The difference is that for leaders, trust takes on a dimension that is, is not there necessarily in other working relationships. For instance, if you and I have simply a social relationship, I will trust you if you prove yourself to be a person of good character. And in American society, this isn't true globally, I've worked in some societies where it's not true, but in American culture, by default, we tend to trust people we've just met. Mm. We believe that they're respectable, they are respectful, they have some basic integrity, that they're going to be truthful with us. So our default position is to trust. And in a setting where our relationship is social, if you have shown me that you have good character, I'll trust you. So we meet at a networking event, and a few weeks later we meet at another one. And then at a third one, I'm talking to someone. You walk across the room and you say, uh, hey, I saw you didn't get a chance to visit with you. I've got to get back to the office, but I wanted to at least say hi as I leave and go get the car and get out of here. And then you stop and you say, oh, my goodness, I was in such a rush to get here. I left my wallet on my desk. I can't get out of the parking garage. Could you spare me 20 bucks to get the car out of the garage? If, if I've established that you're a person of character, I'm not going to hesitate to tell you, sure, here's 20 bucks. Pay me back when you get a chance. Don't, don't even pay me back if you don't have a chance. Do, just take it and go. Now then, if you're my dentist or my surgeon, I want you to be a person of character 
if I'm going to trust you, I want to trust your character that you're not going to uh, gouge me on the bill. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I trust that, that you won't. <laughs> I, I want to know also that you've got competency. Right. Where did you get trained? How many times have you done this procedure? What is the success yes. rate? Now you've got to demonstrate competency for me to trust you professionally. Mm -hmm. We still have to have the social trust, but now the professional trust calls for something Needs to further. Be there intact, right? When you step into leadership, you've got to have the character that people can trust. You've got to show the competency that people can trust. But now there's a third dimension. The third dimension is you've got to have concrete results that are the results the organization needs. People will not trust a leader even if they know the leader is professionally competent and is a person of good character if that leader is not consistently getting the results that we need. And so there have been many stories of people uh, that were very successful in prior leadership roles who came into a new position. John Scully at Apple is a classic mm -hmm. example of it who was not successful in that role and lost the trust of the organization. They still thought he was a very competent person. They still thought he was a very honorable person. He just was not getting the results that he needed in that setting. And so they moved him aside. The same is true anywhere we find leadership. We, if we cannot get the results we need, it's not a reflection on our character or our competency. Sometimes it's just the wrong leader in the wrong place at the wrong time. But we've got to maintain as a leader trust in all three of those areas if we're going to be trusted as a leader. So what is the kind, is there an ideal corporate environment that can really allow trust and trust building to flourish? Yes, there are certain things that happen in the corporations that build high levels of trust that are largely underplayed or not even, um, not even given much attention in other settings. One of the things that ha is there is that leadership is very conscious of creating a trust-friendly atmosphere. The reason for that is that trust is as much about how I feel towards someone as what I know about the person. Now, I may know some things about them that keep me from trusting, but for, for me to trust a person, an organization, an environment, I need to feel safe, mm -hmm. informed, respected, valued, and understood. And corporations that promote a setting in which people do feel safe, informed, respected, valued, and understood are creating the kind of atmosphere in which trust can flourish. Safety here is not just physical safety, as you might need with a railroad or a mining operation. It is emotional. It is psychological. It is uh, social. I've got to feel that I can voice my opinion, I can offer my view, and not worry about what people are going to say behind my back. Uh, I can raise my objection to what we're doing because I think there's something we've not thought through well without worrying about the consequences that are going to come from my, my having challenged the status quo. In that world then, uh, we want to create this environment, first of all, where people feel safe enough to speak up because if they're not safe enough to speak up, the team is never going to get the benefit of what they could contribute. Now then. The second thing, informed, when people don't take the time to keep me informed of what's going on, yeah. I feel that they don't really trust me or value me. And remember, that's the fourth thing we're talking about. They've got to feel valued. If I'm not valued enough that you will keep me informed, then uh, I'm not sure that I trust you to, to be caring for me and, and my concerns deeply enough that uh, I'm going to just give you unequivocal trust as my leader. Respect, we live in a world in which the, the street gangs gave us the word dissing people, <laughs> you know. <Right. laughs> Nothing worse than to diss someone. Yeah, or be dissed. <laughs> or to be, to be dissed, yeah, that's right. And so uh, uh, building that respect 
Uh, being sure that people talk to one another in respectful ways. Uh, being sure that we get uh, racist and, and ethnic slurs uh, and illusions and jokes out of, the, out of the workplace, where every person is treated with respect. That then communicates to them that they are valued. And once they are valued, then they are going to uh, be more eager to share their views, at which point we don't have to go along with what they want to do, they will accept that leadership doesn't go along with what they want to do if they feel that they were heard and they were understood. Right. So those are the kinds of things that organizations that are building a high trust climate focus on at the basic level. How is the trust a leader needs different than other types of trust, doctor? Well, coming back to my my statement a while ago that leaders have to be able to get concrete results. Leaders will be trusted only to the degree that they communicate to people a clear sense of I know where I'm going right. and I want you to go with me. Only to the degree that people feel that the leader really cares for them. There's a really famous story about something that Dwight Eisenhower did in the days immediately before the D-Day invasion. He would break away from the bunker where he and Churchill and their staffs were planning the next few hours and days and go down to the waterfront where troops were waiting to be embarked. And he would simply walk among the soldiers, introducing himself, shaking hands, where are you from, tell me about yourself, always hoping he would run into someone from Abilene, Kansas, where his hometown never did. But finally, his aides came to him and said, General, you need to be back at the bunker planning this invasion, not down here glad-handing, and you know, <laughs> that, they, that wasn't their term, but in effect, why are you down here glad-handing the troops? Eisenhower's response was, there are many people back at headquarters who can plan better than I can. But these young men deserve to look me in the eye and see how much I care for them before I, before I send them into the hell I'm about to send them into. Mm -hmm. Now that's one of the reasons that Eisenhower was always known as the soldier's general. Right. The, the lowest private felt that General Eisenhower really cares for me and he's not going to ask me to do something that he hasn't thought through and doesn't think is necessary. So one of the things that leaders have to do is they have to communicate that care for people because if someone really cares for me, in a world in which very few people show care toward me, right. I will do everything I can not only to please that person but to help that person succeed. You know, there's, I guess I would imagine, many different ways that one can define leadership. Um, how do you define it? I mean, you're immersed in it mm -hmm. all your life. How do you define leadership now? Well, there are, as you've said, a, a lot of definitions of leadership out there. Uh, I've certainly been able to compile dozens and dozens over the years. Every book on leadership has to offer one of necessity. And we have lots of books on leadership, so we have lots of definitions. One of the things that struck me early on about many of those definitions is that they were appropriate definitions for someone who was an executive or someone leading a huge organization. I wanted to think of leadership as something that happens at every level of society. So the den mother for a Cub Scout group is a leader. Nice. What is the common trait between what the den mother is doing and what the CEO of an international conglomerate is doing? As I began to look at the common denominators, the de definition that I finally developed is that leadership is the art of rallying people around a shared purpose, then motivating them and mo mobilizing them to achieve it. It's an art because it, you can't apply principles of leadership scientifically. It, it, I, I like to compare it to an artist uh, like my son, who is, is quite accomplished as an artist, works in a lot of different media. So he works with charcoals, he works with oil, he works 
uh, with pastels. He works on various substrates, wood, leather, mm -hmm. canvas, paper. When he moves from one medium to another or from one application um, to another, the techniques change. But the basic rules of art remain the same. The rules of perspective are the same. The harmonious, uh, or, or the, the complementary color wheel is the same. There are certain fundamentals that don't change. The art is knowing how to use these materials and this medium in a way that captures the potential that both of them have and brings out great beauty. A leader is doing the same thing. There are principles of leadership that are true at every level of leadership, but how we apply those in a given context is where the art comes in and where the best way to learn to lead is simply to lead and mm. learn. <laughs> yeah, that's right, exactly. And I know that my mother was a den mother for Pac-166 <laughs> when I was in the Cub Scouts on Long Island, New York. <laughs> and she was a real leader. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and everybody that, in control. And, and one of the things that distinguishes leaders from managers is that managers always have a, an identified place in the organization chart. Leaders do not necessarily. Right. There are many unofficial leaders. Right. We call them opinion leaders sometimes. Yep. You know, what, who, who they may be. We have to discover ourselves as leaders so we can get their alliance in what we want to do. But they don't have the managerial authority right. to get things done, but they have the influence because yeah. of their own credibility, yeah. their own character, their own experience. People respond to People them. People respond to them. People follow them. So leaders get, get, uh, thing, get things accomplished through influence. Managers may as well, but ultimately the manager has positional authority to fall back on. Right. The leader doesn't necessarily have that. I, I can think of one Fortune 25 company that I did some work with a number of years ago. And there was a fellow back in the back part of the organization who had been the eighth employee ever hired. Unlike everyone else in that original core, he had not gone to the top and taken an executive job. He loved the technology. Right. And he was back in there with his fingers in the technology all day long. I noticed when we were having a, a large meeting, and there would be senior VPs and senior management all around the table, and he would be here, and everybody was talking uh, back and forth, and one person would be making a point, and two or three people over here are having a sidebar conversation, and this person over here is trying to check his, his emails because you're not supposed to be checking emails right. in the meeting. But he's, Facebook. He's, he's, yeah. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> then this fellow would speak up, and when he would speak up, the room went silent and everybody turned to see what he had to say yeah. because his credibility and his corporate knowledge was so great yeah. that when he said this is what we ought to do, some people making a lot more money than he was <laughs> would, would nod their heads and say that, that, that's probably right. Yeah. So that's what I mean by leaders have influence without necessarily having positional authority. So does it pay, does it make sense and is it important then for those who do have the positional authority to embrace the leader? If the leader is the leader but they don't necessarily have that authority, yet they do mm -hmm. have the following, they do have the respect, they have, you know, they can get it done. I know there's probably times when the managers might even be able, feel threatened by somebody that they see who mm -hmm. doesn't have the authority but they are getting the response of other staff because they are a leader maybe even an understated leader so does it pay heed for managers to recognize the leader and encourage and embrace them and propel them because it will help the overall um, you know positioning of the company and, mm -hmm. and the relationships and profitability the whole thing well, the, the manager who doesn't do that is telling you that he or she as a manager is insecure. And they feel threatened. And by feel the, threatened yeah, by this, this person. Other person yeah. Wise managers 
are going to ally themselves with those leaders. I, I, I'll give you an example from my na Navy background. As a young officer, one of the things you're taught is when you go aboard ship and you're given a, a group of, of sailors to uh, be responsible for, make good friends with the chief petty officer and let him run the ship. You sign off on what he thinks is the thing to do. In other words, <laughs> Here's a guy that the troops re uh, respect. Uh, they know he knows the ropes. You don't come in here and start telling him or anyone else how to do it. You find a way to capitalize on what he already gives you, and then you add the new dimensions that you think are, uh, are going to be helpful, but in a way that respects that structure and, and uh, uh, influence that's already present in the organization. A wise manager is going to do that. They're going to say, if I've got someone who can m marshal people around what we want to do, I'm going to enlist him to help us move in the direction that I want us to move. That then is a manager who is also wearing a leadership hat. Leaders are always allying themselves with other leaders. The responsibility of the leader in this case is to keep that person who who has the influence, fully informed of where I'm wanting to go, providing feedback on how we might do it even more effectively, and continually affirming my belief in this person so that this person's influence in that circle that he has credibility with will continue to be uh, reinforced, and people will see that I respect the person that, that, that they respect. So it's a, it's a working alliance, and managers who are good at capitalizing on that natural influence that is there are far more effective at bringing about change. Mm. Because managing change, especially wholesale change, is always fraught with opportunities for the wheels to come off. Yeah. And so uh, astute managers who are facing a need to make wholesale change are going to seek out their opinion leaders in the group and before anything else is said they're going to bring them into their confidence and get their thoughts their input and get them on board so that when the manager starts implementing the change they are nodding in agreement with what the manager is saying and by that nodding in agreement bringing their team along with them I would imagine it's beneficial and do you have to be a visionary to be an effective leader? Visionary, if you understand it in the right sense. You, I've worked for some really great leaders in a number of settings who were not particularly visionary in the way that we normally think of this, of having a, a great dream that they have generated. But what they all had was the ability to recognize a compelling vision maybe that someone else has developed and articulated, but they say, yes, I can see how that might, uh, might be the thing that we ought to do. Let me look at that some more and see if I can't get behind it. And now then, they have the gift, once they see the vision, to communicate it in such a way that motivates and mobilizes people to get behind it. Uh, the fact of the matter is we don't need a C-suite filled with visionaries in the traditional sense of the word. We can have too many cooks in the kitchen. Yeah. Before long, everybody is vying for his or her sense of where we ought to be going. Nothing gets done, right? Yeah, yeah. But you need one person at least who can come up with a, a, a really compelling vision that everyone else says, hey, I can get behind that, and I know how we could implement that in this department, in this division, in this enterprise. So vision is vitally important. Next to values, it's the most important thing for leaders to be clear on. But the vision doesn't necessarily have to be the vision they created, but simply one that they recognized and threw their weight behind. What would you say are some of the basic elements of success for a leader? That's a, that's a good question because success in part is measured by the context and the set of objectives that are before us. Obviously, uh, success in an 
in an emergency medical clinic is going to be defined differently than success in managing um, a manufacturing line, okay? So first of all, we have to define success in terms of what is the desired outcome for this thing that I'm leading? And do I have the technical know-how? Do I have the experience? Do I have the wisdom to be able to achieve that success? If I don't, then how do I build a team around me? And how do I develop myself so that I am equipped to do it? My most influential mentor, and he, this was not a formal working relationship. He simply took me under wing when I was in my 20s. He was 30 years my, my senior at that point. And we remained close friends up until his death. <clears throat> and he always enjoyed being a mentor to me and a, in the best sense of the word never in a scolding way. But one of the things he said to me early on and said it over and over and over is we all have a flat side on our wheel somewhere. The sooner we can recognize that flat side and build people and systems around us to compensate for it, mm -hmm. the more successful we will be and the sooner we will be successful. I took that lesson into everything that I did as a college president, as a, as a military officer, uh, as, a, as a minister. Every enterprise that I entered into where I had the ability to choose my number two person, mm. I chose someone who could compensate for the flat side of my wheel. They had to be, for instance, uh, I love solving problems. And the more complex the problem, the more fascinated I am at solving it. But I get my fulfillment from finding the solution, not necessarily from implementing the solution. It's what, the hunt, the search, the, yeah, yeah right. Well, the part journey. of the problem is when I start implementing the solution, I put my, my head to that task and I start after it. But out of the corner of my eye over here, I suddenly begin to realize, oh, boy, there's a problem over there needs a solution. Mm -hmm. When I get this finished, I really... I'm going right to that one. Going right to that one. And then a minute later, I'm still working on this, and I think, hmm, how would I solve that? Oh, no, I've got to work on this. Uh, hmm. Yeah. And before long, I'm off working on that problem rather than carrying through on the implementation here. Finishing that here. one, right. So the thing that I required of my number two people was they had to be good implementers, ruthless implementers. And they had to have enough strength of ego that they would not hesitate to walk into me, into my office, or walk up to me in the hallway and say, boss, the wheels are about to fall off because you're over here doing this and not sticking with the implementation. You've got to get back up. Hold me to task. Hold me accountable. So that's the reason that uh, success is in many ways a team sport today. Right. You've got to have people who can round out what you are not particularly good at. And there's been a lot of study that shows this. If I could t share a, uh, an, an interesting study, one group of men who were executive coaches and professional leadership developers studied 20,000 360 reviews to see if they could decide what separated the top 10% of performers from the bottom 20 or 30%. Were there traits that were very common in the top 10% that were not there in the lower third of the groups that were reviewed? They looked at about 75 different variables. I mean, this was, a, this was an exhaustive study yeah. that took years. Yeah. What they found was they could identify distinctives that put people in the top 10%, and there were 16 of them. But what they learned was that they didn't find anyone who was good at more than three or four of those, maybe five. But they were so good at those things that they created a halo effect, and people gave them credit for being better at other things than they really were, and they in turn realized that they had to have a reputation of being good at those things, and so they built the people and systems, the teams around them, to be sure those things were taken care of. That's really part of success is knowing how to build that team success that I get credit for perhaps as a leader more so than I should. Most of the things that, I, that I've been praised for and honored for over my life 
it was the number two person who really made it happen. If I had not had that number two person, the honor would have never come my way. Mm -hmm. And so that whole dynamic is what it's about in trying to make yourself successful. Really fascinating stuff, it really is. There's so much uh, understanding the human condition and psychology that's involved in a lot of this, isn't there? Oh, yes. And of course, we're now beginning to be a little bit friendlier toward what were once called the soft skills. Mm because we're beginning to realize that they are not really soft at all. They are hard contributors to the bottom line. Right. One of the problems with our modern accounting system is that it does not have a way to, uh, to account for the fact that our most valuable asset is our people. If you think about it, workers on a, on a balance sheet are shown as a liability. Mm -hmm. Salaries owed them, retirement, they're due, taxes to be paid on their salary. Yet, at quitting time every day, our most valuable assets leave the building. And if we don't recognize that they are an asset that we must hold on to, then we're setting ourselves up for, for failure sooner or later and yeah. probably sooner in today's world. In that reality, then, when uh, I look at people being my primary focus, and as a leader, I have to do that because we speak of managing people and we speak of managing, uh, of leading people. We also speak of managing budgets, managing inventories. We would never speak of leading a budget or right. leading an inventory. Right. Leadership is uniquely people centric in a way that management may or may not be. Management tends to be much more process-centric. Leadership always has to be people-centric. So the manager who is going to add leadership to what he or she brings to the game has to be sensitive to people, and that forces us to look at psychology. It forces us to look at culture. It forces us to look at sociology, because that's what makes t people tick. And I need people to tick as well as they can if we're going to take advantage of this asset that I've been entrusted with. Speaking of leadership and management, we touched a little bit on it uh, earlier. I'd love to expand on it. How leadership and management relate to one another in an effective way. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to foster that and maintain that since they're coming from different perspectives oftentimes? First of all, we have to recognize it's not an either or. One of the uh, unfortunate things that happened in the 1990s when suddenly there was an explosion of books on leadership is that some of those books sort of left you thinking at the end that leadership is the real thing. Management is old school. That's the old stuff. The fact of the matter is there is a management component to leadership. I said it's the art of rallying people around a shared purpose uh, and then motivating them and mobilizing them to achieve it. When it comes to the mobilization moment, there's a huge management function to be fulfilled there. And if the leader is not someone who's good at management, that's where these number two people, that's yeah. where you, you build a team around you that's good at the implementation while you continue to motiv motivate people and rally people to uh, the cause that you're, you're trying to, uh, to advance. Now, in that world, uh, where leaders and managers uh, are working us alongside one another, I think it was counterproductive in the 90s when a certain book seemed to be dismissive of management. Fortunately, people realized that mistake pretty quickly, and we've come back yeah. to a more ma a balanced view of things. And the way that I try to get people to understand that balance is by using the analogy of riding a bicycle. There are two pedals on a bike. At one moment, one pedal is carrying the load. At another moment, the other pedal is carrying the load. And the art of riding the bike well is knowing when each pedal needs to be carrying the load. In management and leadership, there are times in an organization in which leadership needs to be at the fore. There are other times that management needs to be at the fore. That can be determined by a lot of different things. One has to do with the industry. I'll give you a good example. Burlington Northern Santa Fe, one of my largest clients for, for many, many years. 
has as their core orchestrating ideology what they call a leadership model. Uh, there are five elements of that model. And they have to do with, with leading more, managing less, casting a compelling vision, modeling the way, communicate, 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 and develop your people. Those are the five elements of the leadership model. And so they attract a lot of people, particularly when they're recruiting C-level executives and upper-tier management, a lot of people who are attracted to the leadership model. But as I coached some of those people after they came into the organization, what they didn't take into account is no matter how much BNSF focuses on leadership, it has to be a management-dominated company because there are hundreds of trains to put together every day mm -hmm. yeah. to run through thousands of jurisdictions, each one with its own local rules as to what yeah. you can and cannot do. It, it will literally come off the rails if it's not well managed. <laughs> yeah. So there are some companies, airline industries are one, uh, others that because of, they are so regulated, management must be very prominent. And yet there are times when an when a airline has to make a turnaround that leadership needs to be at the fore because we've got to come up with a new sense of who we are, uh, finding a way to connect with a new customer base. All the things that go into the, the turnaround experience are really leadership's function, not so much management's function. Another thing is where we are in the state of an economy. Uh, during the pandemic, management had to play a much larger role mm -hmm because everything was in decline and we were needing to conserve resources, we were needing to maximize the, the people that we could tap into to work. Everywhere you turned, there was a management challenge. Now when we start coming out of it and there are customers to be reclaimed and there are markets to be penetrated for the first time, leadership needs to come to the fore. So it's, it's a complementary working relationship between leadership and management and the skill is knowing when to put on the management sombrero, when to put on the leadership sombrero, and what you're doing differently based on the sombrero that you're wearing. I love that analogy of the, uh, of the bike and the pedal is going up and down because it's important to keep that bike upright and balanced, too, right. along the way. Right, right. Um, and I, and I, <laughs> I'll just add that I live uh, near White Rock Lake in Dallas, which is the lake that the Dallas Marathon encircles. And there's great biking paths around it, uh, seven miles around the lake. About three and a half miles around the lake one day, I broke a pedal on a bike. I discovered you can ride a bicycle with one pedal. It's not very artful, it's not very graceful, and it's not very efficient. So you can have organizations that get by with only management. Right. But it will never be the artful, graceful organization it could be if it knew how to bring leadership to bear uh, in the day-to-day -day life of the, of the group. Keeping that chain intact is important too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you're talking about the pandemic at the time of this uh, filming for this close-up television uh, episode. Um, a lot has changed mm -hmm. too. A lot in the way we're doing business, conducting business, the way people are working with the shift to working at home. Yes. and all the Zoom meetings and, and conferences and the embracing and quick learning by fire, trial by fire, uh, with technology now and embracing mm -hmm. that for a lot of staff, a lot of people. Um, how is that changing? I mean, obviously leaders, managers have had to pivot with that because their staffs aren't necessarily in the same facility, the same building. Mm -hmm. We can quickly call a meeting, we're all together, you have visual contact and you know the one-on-one, -on -one, uh, we're now on screens, on computers. Mm -hmm. How does that come into play in terms of being able to maintain the, the leadership and rallying the troops and getting everybody on the same page because in a lot of perspectives, uh, we're not in even the same room or same building anymore. Mm -hmm. What we are dealing with on a universal level is what a lot of very senior executives in international conglomerates have dealt with for years. Uh, I had a client uh, for a while whose number two was in Brazil, his number three was in Hong Kong, uh, he had someone in Nairobi, he had someone in Stockholm, he had someone uh, in one of the cities of Germany, I can't remember which, but uh, he saw everyone face-to-face -face once a year at a strategy session that they called to 
sort of think through where we are and where we want to go. People at that level and having to deal with that dispersion of their team were considered the, the oddball a few years ago. Now then, everybody's getting a taste of what that is like. But fortunately, there are people like that who were already working that way from whom we can learn how we work in these kinds of disjointed and disparate uh, working relationships. One of the things that I think is important is that it's easy with these uh, Zoom technology communication approaches to use them to just communicate content, to get marching orders out for the day, and not use them as an opportunity to remind people of what it is we're about. Going, going back to that uh, uh, unifying ethos I was talking about a while ago, as we are talking with our people, are we reminding them of this is what we do? Right. Because they're working independently and they're going to be coming up with a lot of ideas which really translate into a lot of rabbits they could go chase. Right. Okay? This is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. And, of course, some of the most important work that has been done in leadership in the last few years is the surfacing of the question of why. Uh, start with why uh, has become a phrase that you will hear over and over. Uh, as a result of that emphasis on why, it, people are beginning to ask the question more, why this? Why mm. are we doing it this way? That has the potential of being very worthwhile and very constructive. But at the same time, people are looking for meaning in what they're doing. They're look, wanting, they don't want to just work on something. They want it to be worthwhile. So that why we're doing it is really critical. So what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Mm -hmm. How do we do it? Whether we're working together or, yeah. or, or, or a, a, as a group. And who are we doing this for so that they win? Right. Can we keep those people in mind? Uh, those kinds of conversations need to be spliced into the more technical ways that we're using these Zoom calls. And there's the reason that we got into these more technical ways to use it is I think all of us went into this, I know I certainly did, think we were going to be dis displaced for a few days, a few weeks, a few months. None of us in March or April last year of 2020 would have thought that 18 months later mm. we would still not be able to get people together in the same room. As a result, we sort of set a pattern of using these as stopgap communication measures, not team building measures. Right. Now then, we're getting to the point where I've got people calling me and saying, we've not done any leadership training in two years because it all got taken off the table last year until the pandemic was over. We never could get to it. Our, our culture is beginning to get frayed. Uh, our shared values are no longer fully understood by a lot of the new people who've come on board. They're realizing that we're now in a permanent state of operating in, a, in an altogether different way. And so the Zoom communication has to be of a much broader, uh, better thought out. We, we really need a strategy for how we're going to re remotely manage people and lead them so that they stay on the same team. There's another problem that I'm dealing with, uh, with managers uh, of people who had never considered and never thought they wanted to work uh, independently, who have learned that they love it. Right. They don't have to put up with the commute. They are more productive because they don't have other workers dropping by and sticking their head in the, uh, in the door and saying, hey, you, you, how'd you like the game last night? You know, right. they, they, they can control the disruption pattern. And if they wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning, they can go in at 6 o'clock and start going uh, to work on some things that they know they've got to get off the desk today. They love that flexibility. And interestingly, the people who have tracked, have invested in the tools to track the productivity of their people working at home, have in many, many cases found our people are more productive in this environment than they are here. Now, does everybody like that? No, because there are some people, particularly the extroverts, who really need that frequent interaction yeah, with right. other people in order to stay energized. On the other hand, a lot of people who never thought they would enjoy working alone have found that they do and are resenting 
the talk of being forced to come back into the commons. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to several senior managers who are concerned that their CEO is not willing to consider any alternative but getting people yeah, under the same back. roof once again as soon as possible. And these people are saying, I'm going to be losing half my people because there are other people who will hire them with their capability and let them work at home. Them work and at if home. they have that option, I'm afraid I'm going to lose them. So this has brought on a whole new set of, of considerations that we're working through and still don't have the master plan for. <laughs> In relation to that, what would you say are some of the primary factors then that uh, will determine whether a business succeeds or fails in this current economic environment we're in? It doesn't matter what business you're in, what industry you're in. For the last couple of decades, there have been three things that you've got to have going for you. If you're going to increase your likelihood of surviving to the point that it's not worrying you day and night. And those three things are agility, speed, and innovation. We all uh, remember the, the nursery rhyme, Jack be nimble, Jack be quick, Jack jump over the candlestick. Uh, one of my earliest memories is as a toddler standing at the window in the back bedroom of our house, looking out across the yard and reciting that. Jack be nimble, Jack be quick, except I had a lisp, and so it came out, and Jack jump over the candle thick. I, I, I later came to believe that whoever decided to spell lisp with a uh, S yeah. <laughs> played a cruel joke on, was... on the people who had a lisp. <laughs> so, so here I was as a youngster talking about Jack being quick and nimble and innovative enough to figure out how, how to get over this candlestick. The guy who came up with that was not a leader, he was a manipulator. <laughs> <laughs> good, good thought. I never dreamed that at, at a point 40 or 50 years later in my life, I would be talking to CEOs and boards about the need to be like Jack, quick, nimble, and innovative. But the fact of the matter is, mm -hmm. companies that cannot turn on a dime are not going to be competitive in a world where the realities are changing so quickly, so, quickly. So, so broadly that we find ourselves waking up suddenly facing a completely new world from the one that we had ever envisioned. We've got to be speed. It's got to be speed because people are expecting, you know, Amazon has, has really, uh, Amazon Prime has really Everything. corrupted our yeah. thinking about yeah. what's reasonable delivery times. Yeah, right. And so think of the small retailer who can't afford the inventory to give it to you immediately, but how soon can he get it to you? Uh, that's going to become essential for that small retailer to, to continue to prosper. And, and basically, speed means doing three things rapidly. Rapid response, rapid recalibration, when uh, things are not what they should be, and rapid corrective measures, okay? We've got to be able to be rapidly moving through that sequence on a continual basis. And then innovation. Um, look at all of the industries that have disappeared yeah. because they did not anticipate innovations that someone was coming up with, innovations that proved completely disruptive. I saw a study the other day Even that, like the internet itself, too, they didn't adapt to the internet. Uh, exactly, exactly. And I saw a study the other day that identified 53 products that the cell phone has replaced. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, you now have a level on your phone. Yeah. So if you're a carpenter going in to bid a job, you can tell whether the floor is level. Cameras. You, cameras. You've got a compass. So if you're going for a hike, you don't worry about having a, 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 a right. compass with you because, you know, you, you, your, your phone will, will tell you what's north and what's east. And <laughs> the encyclopedia salesman's <laughs> out of business. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> everywhere, you, everywhere you turn, yes, totally. one or two innovations properly positioned, finding popularity, can completely disrupt what you're doing. And so leadership has to continually be saying, what are our blind spots? What's the disruptive technology we have not anticipated? 
A good friend of mine uh, was uh, the CEO and chairman of the board of the largest company in his industry globally and was running operations on six continents. He and I were having breakfast one day, and uh, this would have been 30 years ago. He asked me about a new technology that was emerging and what I thought it would lead to. And I said, well, I don't know a lot about it, but the promise that it has uh, seems to be legitimate, and the potential to change the game, I think, is pretty significant. And he said, I think so, too. Mm. He was extremely widely read. That was one of his gifts as a CEO. He was well informed. And he said, if it succeeds, the core business of our company goes away. So I was getting ready to retire. I think I just upped my contract for five more years because I've got to completely repackage this thing before I give it to someone else. Yeah. And he did, over five years, took a company that was thriving in one uh, industry and moved them into a completely different set of services that they were thriving in when he did pass the baton. Mm. And so that's the kind of leadership on a smaller scale we need. What could disrupt us and how would we recover yeah. if it were to do so? Because again, there's so much of it that's happening uh, at warp speed now. I mean, things that you would have predicted five years ago that are in effect now, we could never have dreamed of. And it's happening quicker and quicker and quicker, so you have to adapt. One of the things that that has impacted is the ability of a lot of organizations to develop a long-term vision. Yeah. Uh, and I first saw this in the high-tech industry in the late 90s and, and early part of the 2000s. Uh, as the technology was evolving so f rapidly, by the time they got a vision well articulated and, and uh, widely communicated, the realities were changing so much it was already becoming outmoded. And so one of the things that a lot of companies have gone to is instead of trying to create a strategic vision, to create strategic thinking that is mobile and fluid so that you're always reassessing where are we today, where were we yesterday, where are we going to be tomorrow, how do we be, how do we make the adjustments that we've got to make to stay relevant and current going forward. So we're, we're seeing more and more emphasis on strategic thinking rather than necessarily a well-articulated strategic vision. And that comes back to what I was saying a while ago about values, uh, when I spoke of values perhaps being even more important than vision. If you can't get a clear, crisp vision, but you are very clear on your core values and you hold to them, I've learned you get about 80% of the benefit of a well-articulated vision because you're not going to make bad decisions if you're holding true to your core values. The, the friend I talked about a moment ago, five years later when he had completely transformed his company, the core values were still the same as when he was doing something completely different. Yeah. Okay? The day-to-day -day operations looked entirely different. Uh, but he was a man who put great emphasis on values and he held those values constant and that gave him then the ability to maintain momentum, hold his team together and innovate even though the vision was changing considerably. So it's obvious vision and values collectively can contribute to organizational success. It, and, and the fact of the matter is we're going to have values whether we articulate them or not. Uh, the culture is going to define its own values. Culture is simply the behavior pattern that results from the beliefs, um, habits, and attitudes that prevail within an organization. Right. Anywhere you bring people together, very quickly there's going to be a culture and there will be certain things that are valued and other, other things that are not valued within that culture. The role of leadership is to be very purposeful in, in determining what the values should be, establishing those clearly and articulating, articulating them frequently and in a multitude of different uh, venues. The challenge then becomes keeping those core values few in number. Uh, when I'm helping a company define its core values, I try to never let us get beyond seven. In fact, uh, you know, I'll just say, no, we're not going to go there. I try to make it five. 
because if they are core values, they need to be things that everyone can easily remember. I, I took on a new client in the healthcare industry a few years ago, and when I walked into their office, their corporate suite for the first time, here beside the door was uh, a poster that said, our core values, mm -hmm. and there were 14 of them. I thought, 14 core values. So then I'm in a meeting with the C-level executives later that day, and we're, we're talking about uh, the possible engagement. And I said, one of the things I really treasure about this organization is it considers values so important that you've got your core values posted just as people come in the door. And, you know, I didn't get a chance to look at them closely, but there was, and I mentioned two or three of them, and I said, now, what, what, what were the, some of the others? They couldn't name them themselves. Hmm. Right. And I just let them come to that realization. I just sat there and let the silence run. And I said, if you as the C-level executives can't tell me what the core values are, no one on the floor can tell me what the core values are. So what does that tell you about your core values? Right. And the CEO said, they're a waste, aren't they? I said, your words. <laughs> 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 but that's, that's a mistake. So the core values, now I'm not talking about the strategic values and the operational values, the core values need to be few in number and so, so important that even if we have to change direction completely, change industry, if we have to be agile, speedy, and, and, and innovative, the core values will still hold us in place. Mm -hmm. A good example of this is Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Yeah. When Jack started Enterprise Rent-A-Car, he not only spelled out what he was trying to do with the company, but what he was not going to do. And one of the things he said is, we are not going to compete with Hertz and Avis in the short-term rent-a-car market. His original idea was to lease cars long-term to customers of the Cadillac store that he was right. a salesman for. Right. That was all he was interested in doing. But he said, Avis and, 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 and Hertz have a corner on the airport market. We're not going to get that in that. How do you go from that to being the largest rental car company in the world? It's because what he did was articulate a handful of values that the company still holds to today. Yeah. And being true to those values forced him to change his operations until little by little he was doing the very thing he once said he was not going to do. One of those things was... Uh, to do more than the customer expects. Yeah, and what he would find was that the customers he had leased a car to expected this. And so he would add that. And then people would expect something else. And he would add that. And little by little, being true to the values got them where they are today. <laughs> <laughs> but 14 core values, that's a lot. 14 core values. I mean, that, those are not core values. I was going to say, if you're forced to have to remember 14 core values, how are you going to remember the Ten Commandments? <laughs> Well, and, 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 there, and there is, you were talking about psychology a while yeah. ago. There is a psychology behind it. There is a principle in, in cognitive theory that says the mind is, the conscious mind is capable of tracking seven plus or minus two streams of information simultaneously. Some people it's as low as five. Some people it's as high as nine. But most of us comfortably track about seven streams of information simultaneously and we're filtering out everything else uh, that's going on around us. That's why if I start giving you a list of numbers uh, and I give you five numbers, you can repeat them back to me easily enough. I get to seven, you can probably do that. But when I start getting to the 11th and 12th, yeah. all of a sudden you're trying to listen to this number and go back and rehearse the first three because they're being pushed out yeah. of the bandwidth that you've got available to track these things. So one of the things that's important for leaders is to package values and to package goals and to package strategies in small enough bundles that we're not overtaxing the seven plus or minus two rule. Right. And it is easy to do because the problem is when we get together and start trying to define our core values, we can easily find that there are 14, or I've had as many as 32 proposed by different people, and somebody can defend every one of those as being valuable enough to be a core value. And coming to consensus on what our core values are going to be is a real task in facilitation 
especially if you've got a lot of highly opinionated people who are part of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Which often happens. <laughs> Which often happens. <laughs> Which leads me to how do you define corporate culture? Well, it, it is, as I said a while ago, the behavior that flows from the beliefs, uh, attitudes, and um, uh, habits that just emerge within an organization. The corporate culture becomes deeply rooted. It becomes so much the way we do things that it is powerful at resisting our efforts to uproot it. So corporate culture tends to change rather slowly, which then puts it at odds with agility, speed, and innovation. The reason that it changes slowly is that what corporate culture is trying to create is stability and predictability. Uh, stability because most people are more emotionally comfortable and psychologically comfortable when things are not in upheaval. Yeah. There are very few people who wake up in the morning and say, well, I hope today is just topsy-turvy every way uh, I turn, okay? We like stability, uh, and we like part of stability is predictability. I know if I do this, this will happen. I know if she calls, I've got to be prepared to do this. We like predictability, and culture is our way of encapsulating predictability and stability. So when it comes time to make cultural change, and you touched early on on one of those, when we went from heavy top-down management to collaborative participative management, that was a huge cultural change. And it did not happen smoothly, it did not happen quickly, and in some places it's still struggling to happen because the old culture is hanging on, its roots are deep in the soil, and it's like trying to pull a sapling out of the ground. You tug and you tug and part of it moves, but part of it doesn't move. <laughs> uh, yeah, and right, and they're, they're, right. there you're stuck. They're entrenched. They're in entrenched. So, That's a good word for it. Uh, so why, that's a good reason there too. What are some of the other reasons why it's so difficult to change an organization's culture? Well, for one thing, um, we are not always good at leaders at communicating the need for change before we make the change. Um, here is one of the things that I warn my clients about all the time when they're looking at a major change. I will say, how long have you been thinking about this? It's not unusual for them to say, oh, a year, 10 months, something like that, sometimes even longer. How long did it take you to get comfortable with this idea? Were you comfortable with it the first time you thought of it? Or were you just curious? Were you just saying, oh, that, that's interesting. How long did it take you to become passionate that this is what you needed to do? Right. Now then, you're a good communicator, Mr. Executive, Ms. Executive, but I doubt that you're a good enough communicator that you can move your people in 15 minutes the distance it took you 15 months to move yourself. Mm. You follow it? Yeah, yeah. That's a mistake. We don't allow for the fact that people first have to understand the change. Right. And the people who study the change process will tell you that people need to hear the change probably six or seven times in detail before they really begin to get it. And the reason is, you start talking to me about the change, and I listen until I, you come to a point that I'm going to have to change this if that happens. Now I'm off chasing that rabbit in my mind while you go on with the rest of your rationale. And I don't pick up the rest of the rationale. The next time you go through it, I don't have to worry about this. I've worked out how I'm going to do that. So I can listen a bit further. And then I hit something else. Oh, wait a minute. This is going to take me off here. We've got to hear it several times until we've worked through all of our personal issues that just naturally come up when someone starts talking to yeah. us about what's going to happen. Resistance or whatever it may and be. And so yeah. there's going to be resistance until I understand, okay? So we've got to give the message in a lot of different formats over a period of, not a long time, but a rather concentrated period perhaps. Sometimes change is urgent and we've got to concentrate it. But as we do so, we have to be sure that people hear it enough that they have worked through it and they've got a cognitive understanding. 
Now then, alongside that, we need to assure them as to what won't change. And that's rarely done. Before long, all people are hearing change, 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 yeah. and they globalize that, and everything is being thrown out. It's just as important to say, we're going to be doing this, but these are the things that are not changing, so that there is some stability, so that there is some predictability. You've got to build that in as sort of a base on which you then uh, uh, anchor the change initiatives. Then, once you've done that, you have to realize that people change emotionally much slower than they do cognitively. This was a valuable lesson for me in my early adulthood. Uh, I was very active in the civil rights movement uh, as a late teenager in my early 20s. Uh, I ran for student body president on a campaign to force the administration to integrate an all-white community college. Okay? Uh, so I was right there pushing for integration but came to realize that there were many people in organizations that had long been segregated that were now integrated who had come to realize that segregation was wrong, but they were still emotionally uncomfortable in an integrated setting. Mm. And they knew that was wrong, and they were trying to outgrow it, but their emotions had not had time to catch up with their co cognitive understanding. That's true in any change process. It's going to have a big impact on people. They will come to understand it long before they will feel comfortable with it. And we've got to continue to nurture the change process through that feeling. And that's where, going back to an earlier part of our conversation, helping people feel safe, informed, respected, valued, and understood is going to be critical because they are now in a setting where they can voice their concerns, they can let their discomfort be known, and they know that they will be heard and that their needs or preferences will be taken into account in whatever decisions are made. Team building, very important too, um, because you can't, you know, no person is an island. Mm -hmm. So getting those people and getting that team atmosphere, I know, is essential. Um, while you're doing that, what would you say are some of the things, and you've outlined a few of them so far, things that leaders can do to sort of embed the organization's most critical values and benefits into that cultural DNA of the overall organization like we're talking about? Okay. Part of it has to do with leaders being consistent with the values themselves. Mm. People will believe what they see us practicing more than they will believe what they hear us advocating. One of the things that, that is uh, part of this is who you praise and who you don't. For instance, I had a, I had a client once who was a C-level executive, head of logistics for a huge defense industry, uh, a defense manufacturer. And when I sat down with him the first time and said, I'd like to talk to you about the values you espouse to your people. The first thing that he mentioned was uh, work-life uh, balance, work-family mm, balance. Yeah. And mm. I said, man, I'm impressed with that. I've worked with a lot of people in y your industry. That's not the first thing that it's comes out of their mouth when out. I talk about that. They talk about quality or productivity or things like that. For that to be your first, that speaks volumes of your character. So I commended him on it. But then when I began to shadow him, I noticed that there was a pattern. If he was speaking to a group of 80, 100 employees, almost inevitably someplace in the course of that conversation or, or uh, presentation, he would say, oh, while we're here today, I want to give a call out to so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. Remember about four months ago, we were 30 days behind schedule on that project? I want you to know they put in 70 hours a week for six weeks in a row, and we're now ahead of schedule. I want us to all stand up and give them a round of applause. Mm. The second time he did that, I said, uh, and the third time he did it, I took him aside and said, don't ever talk about work-family balance to these people. Right. Because what they hear you praise is the people who, who absolutely ignore it. Right. <laughs> okay. So praise what you espouse. Okay. A similar thing is where are your hero stories? 
a company that I was working with, an international company, that needed to con define its core values because they had grown so rapidly that people were coming in from cultures all around the globe and the values were getting frayed around the edges. So I spent a day with them helping them articulate and narrow down their, their core values that they were then going to permeate their culture with. And we finally got finished about 2.30 in the afternoon. And I said, uh, you, you've been around now for five years as a company. You've had some multi-million dollar projects on continents everywhere. I bet there are some hero stories in this organization. Uh, you know, the kind of stories that if I came to work here over coffee with friends uh, uh, at work, uh, with uh, uh, in the carpool when we're going someplace together, I'm going to hear these stories about people who've done great things in this company. Uh, do you have any hero stories? And a woman right across the desk, uh, the table from me said, oh yeah, we've got hero stories. I said, well, tell me one. So she told me a hero story. Now, when she finished, I turned to someone else. I said, you were nodding. Do you have a hero story? Yeah, they told me that. Got four or five to hero stories. Now up here at the head of the table was a flip chart in which we had our final listing of core values. I went over and got another flip chart and I said, okay, I want us to list here what made those people heroes in this mm -hmm. story. Yeah. And so I started writing them down. When we got that list finished, I took that flip chart and went over and sat it beside the core values. And there was complete incongruity. And I said, if you're going to change your culture, you've got to quit celebrating these heroes. Right. You've got to find heroes who embody these values, and you've got to celebrate them. And you could see the lights going around the room. Oh, wow. Aha yeah. uh -huh moments. We, yeah. yeah. We subvert our discussions of vision and values by our behavior and thoughtless comments uh, as, as leaders. Now, then we take this a step further, and that is that... If we are really true to these values, they become a primary determinant in who gets bonused and who gets promoted, who gets the, the really special assignment, uh, who gets commended publicly. Uh, those values determine how we approach those issues. And not only do they determine how we approach them, they determine how we communicate to the person why they're getting the promotion why they're getting the bonus, why they're getting the, uh, the raise. We're, we're doing this because you have been so good at, and they emphasize, we emphasize the values that they have honored, uh, and we continually are finding ways to reinforce that we really believe in these values. Yeah. The most inspirational man that I've ever been around was... Uh, uh, Norval Young, who was the chancellor of Pepperdine University when it moved to Malibu, California. And when I worked uh, on the Malibu campus, uh, there was a pattern I noticed in Norval's conversations with you about your work. We'd be on the parking lot headed uh, away from uh, the offices at the end of the day, and he'd say, Mike, come over here. And he would say, I, I know that you did such and such and such and such. And I would think, how does he even know does that? He know that yeah. Well, the reason was he was always looking for things that people were doing that he could commend. I hadn't figured that out at that point. But while I'm sitting there trying to figure out how did he even know I did that, his statement would be, that is exactly the sort of thing we've got to have more of if we're ever going to. And he would go to the mission statement and quote a phrase out of the mission statement. He would tie the most ordinary things you did to Two. what the institution was all about. So even your most ordinary work yeah. felt valuable, right. felt important. Great idea. Yeah. And as a result, he, he just, I cannot tell you how many college presidents came out of that campus over the next 10 years because young people got inspired by his belief in them and what they were capable of doing. It's a leader. A leader. Yeah. A leader. Yeah. It's a leader. You know, I'm fascinated by your approach. I'd love to focus on your yeah. specific yeah. approach and the company and this idea of leader perfect. Tell us about that and some of the programs you offer. There are folks watching right now who are very fascinated by the conversation and maybe it's giving them an understanding of this work uh, and they'd like to make contact. 
Tell us about your unique approach, because there's a lot of folks out there who do consultant work and they're coaching. And mm -hmm. What is it about Leader Perfect that really stands out? And tell us about some of the, the actual approach. Do you work with uh, individuals, teams, groups? How does that all work with Leader Perfect? Well, in terms of who we work with, it's all of the above. <laughs> it's, all of, it's everybody. <laughs> uh, I describe uh, the company on our website as comprehensive leadership development. And what I mean by comprehensive, there are people who are narrowly niched as coaches or narrowly niched as mentors or trainers. To me, there are so many facets to leadership that we need to integrate uh, all the different ways that we can develop people. And that has been how I have learned and grown best myself, and that's what I want to bring to others. From the very beginning, uh, I felt that one of the things that set us apart is that I bring to leadership development such a ex rich experience in a lot of different leadership roles. Yeah, and a lot of them were challenging roles, turnarounds of organizations that were in real trouble or standing up initiatives that had never uh, been tried before. As a result, there is a, uh, there is a, 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 a col combined wisdom a combined set of experiences, a lot of stories that coaches who just decide one day, I want to be a coach and go get a certificate, simply don't bring to the mix. In fact, uh, one of the things I often will be told in a debrief by a client is, I learned so much from the stories you told. Because every few minutes I'm saying, you know, back in 1976 we were doing this, back in 93 we were doing this, and, and pulling those things together. So I think one of the things that sets us apart is that we're not talking about um, theoretical knowledge, we're not talking about book learning, we're not talking about an MBA course we took. I'm talking about leadership from the standpoint of having been in the trenches in some very demanding leadership posts at a very young age. I was a college president when I was 37. And the college I was president of was in bankruptcy. So, I mean, I, I got a baptism of fire. And it was out of that eventually led to my book, Leadership and the Power of Trust, because I used trust-centered leadership to turn that school uh, around. That's uh, one thing that sets us apart. The second is, and this is not so much a distinctive today as it was when I started. When I began the firm in 2001, there were a lot of people who were hanging their shingles out as coaches or trainers, but they had a set program. You right. bought the program. And, that was it. and it didn't matter what your cultural context was, what the stage of development of your company was, you got the same program. Because I had led in so many different environments, the military, higher education, faith-based institutions, volunteer organizations, political settings, uh, I didn't feel like I had... A, a necessity to force people into one mold. I had uh, enough experience in enough different venues that I could pull those experiences together in a way that customized what the individuals, uh, the, either the individual or the organization needed. I added to this was the fact that uh, I'm a consummate reader. Uh, I've read very widely in a lot of different fields and the cross-fertilization of that yeah. often helps me relate to people who are in industries that before I met them I knew very little about. And I'm able, therefore, to take those principles of leadership that are valid anywhere and cast them in stories and metaphors that relate to this industry out of the things that I've read and studied over the years in other places. The thing that uh, also is very uh, characteristic of what I do is that uh, I sort of let the, the people I'm working with co-create with me the final product, particularly if we're doing long-term leadership development in an organization. Uh, they're going to work with me in defining what the curriculum is going to be, what the coaching themes are going to be. Um, one of the things that I do, I've done with a number of companies is help them build an internal mentoring program so that they don't have to depend on outside people like me. They've got their own team of mentors inside. When you're doing that, then they've really got to co-create with you because they know who their people with mentoring skills are and, and not, and, and what these people are good at doing, what they're not. And so that co-creation 
of a customized leadership package is something that I enjoy doing and I think it's, it's very effective when done, uh, done well. Which you do, you obviously love this work. What is it about this work that really speaks to, to you, doctor? This is, I, uh, <laughs> when, when I talk to leaders and managers, when I talk to just people who are more ordinary citizens about what can make a difference in your life, I say if you can find the purpose for your life, that purpose that energizes you and triggers your passion, it will clarify an awful lot of things and put you on the path to being more effective at what you want to do. When I finally sat down and took the time to go back through my life and say what were the moments I felt most alive? What were the moments that time just almost evaporated because I was so caught up in what I was doing? What were the times that I had been totally exhausted, but because of this experience, suddenly I had energy and energy to run on for the next hour, two hours, or three hours that I didn't think I had within me? What were the common denominators in those? This conversation right now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, what I came to realize, it was when I saw an aha go off in people's eyes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, now I get it. And so then as I worked with that further, I came to realize that my purpose is to help people succeed right. by giving them clarity and insight. And I can help people succeed in a lot of venues, business, family, church, whatever. But the common denominator in all the things that I've really been successful at is that I was giving people uh, the tools for success yeah. by helping them develop greater clarity and insight. Uh, because in a lot of the places that I coach, I know nothing about the business. I just wrapped up an engagement with a steel fabrication plant. Uh, you know, I, I know steel is hard. And I know it comes in rolls. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't pu pu push me much further than that. Uh, but they were in a real crisis. Uh, I came in in a, in a crisis situation and was able to work with them, and we had a, had a great outcome because uh, I knew the questions to ask. Mm. It, 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 it's, it's not so much having the answers as a coach, right. but asking the questions that will give people clarity and insight. And so the questioning is not interrogation. It is let me see how I can phrase a question that will compel him or her to think about this in an altogether different way. Exactly right. Because that different perspective may be all they need to come up with their own solution. I count on my clients having the expertise in their business. I'm not a consultant in that regard. Now, I do consulting for small business startups and businesses that are transitioning from family-owned to publicly owned and that sort of thing. But I, you know, uh, that's a different kind of consulting than coming in and consulting uh, a, a broadcast studio on how to, to, to be a better broadcast studio. <laughs> that's for the consultants to do. But if I were to come into a broadcast studio and coach people, I would be trying to ask the questions or give them metaphors that allow them to reframe the way they've always thought about things so that they can see new possibilities that I perhaps would have never thought of myself. Mm, that is fantastic. It's amazing the work that you do because, like, again, uh, we were saying earlier, it, it's work that is impactful. It can be life-changing for mm -hmm. many people because it's a different perspective. Um, they appreciate their contributions a lot more. And it's really about bringing people together, oh, uh, yeah. being on the same page, keeping that bike upright, balanced, keeping the pedals going up and down. And sometimes, you know, life's challenges and, and things like pandemics or whatever mm -hmm. goes on can really throw a monkey wrench in there. But when everybody is sort of working collaborative, collaboratively, say that again, <laughs> when everybody's working collaboratively and collectively um, and the vision and the values are in line and there is that respect and the understanding that you're appreciated uh, that empathetic, empowering approach mm -hmm. that people are using in leadership, they, you're going to get more from the staff, from the, you know, the collective body. People are going to say, 
they really appreciate what I'm doing mm -hmm. and we're going in the right direction. And that there's nothing better than that, right? Yes, and one of the things that that does for us today, it gives people an experience that they are not getting very many other places. We are perhaps the most polarized we've ever been as yeah. a culture. Yeah. You can argue that the Civil War was more polarizing and, and that you know there's certainly a, a distinct uh, possibility, but the difference was then we were polarized basically over one issue. Right. Today we're polarized on a plethora of issues. And so while I'm trying to solve this polarization between these two people, I step on something that's the polarization between these two people. Right. Every, and the interesting thing is that ex except for the Civil War, every national crisis we've gone through, we've come out of more united than when yes. we went into it. There were people who didn't want to go into the First World War. Sure. But once we were in it, they got behind Everybody, the war machine. Yeah. Second World War, we had our, our people who did not want us involved again in a war in Europe. But once we committed to that war, everybody pitched in to win it. The pandemic is the first national crisis we've come out more divided than we were when we went in. Yeah. And in the course of it, we've lost trust in many medical institutions yeah. because we've gotten such contradictory advice from this respected research center and this respected research center. We've seen our trust in the courts evaporating. Uh, we're seeing the trust which was already in short supply in our society further eroded. Yeah. So people are not having the experience in very many places of being part of a team that's getting something done and everybody feeling good about one right. another. When we can create that in a workplace, we are creating a dynamo that is going to make a profound difference for our survival and for ultimately our profitability, or if we're a nonprofit, for our fundraising and our ability to carry out our, uh, our mission and our, de our desires. And the first way to do that and the first step is to make contact with you. <laughs> you and your team immediately, ASAP, pronto, to at least get in that forward momentum and that forward movement. Uh, this was really an honor and a pleasure to, to meet you and, and speak with you here at our close-up television studio. I know you love this work, and again, you're, you're making, you're living your bliss. Mm -hmm. You're living mm -hmm. yeah. why you are here on this planet. So I'm still doing it at this age. You're st <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you're empowering others, yeah. and, and there's nothing, uh, it's in your DNA. You were meant yeah. to do this. If you look at your body of work, you've always been that that leader in so many different ways and now taking the, that skill set and uh, sharing it with others yeah. and empowering it and imparting this knowledge and wisdom with others. Um, continued success to you, Doctor. Well, thank really, you. I've learned a lot myself. People have referred to me, it's interesting, uh, and it's a phrase I've heard more and more lately. I've been described by many as an understated leader. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the guy who comes in and rah, 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 right. all yeah, right, yeah, let's right. go, come on, like a football coach much more of an understated leader that sort of brings people together, harmonizes, balance. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not an extreme person in either direction. I look for those extremes and try to find the commonality right. and bring them together. And I found that fascinating to be described that way. And there are, I guess, people that are like that, mm -hmm. where they are the comforter in chief, I've been described as, <laughs> uh, the understated leader. Yes, very much. And unfortunately, Sometimes the word leader conveys to people the idea of that charismatic person up front, the rah, rah, rah. First, right. Uh, in the book Good to Great, Jim Collins looked at uh, a dozen, 13, I can't remember the exact number right now, uh, CEOs who took a company that had long performed as part of the, the, the mass, and then suddenly these companies came out of the mass, and they are still, or at least at the time he wrote the book, very distinctively uh, above uh, the competitive uh, market that they're part of. And he wanted to know what is the difference that made the difference. And what he discovered was in each case it was a new CEO who came in. But the interesting thing was that all but one or two of these CEOs were introverts. Mm -hmm. They were not Lee Iacocas. They were people who never appeared on the cover of Business Week. Uh, you didn't see them interviewed on Forbes. 
And one of the reasons was if you went in to talk to them about themselves, they ended up talking about their team and right. their people so much that you left realizing you'd learn very little about them. Okay? Yes, right. They were this under, you, you've used yeah. the word, they were understated leaders sitting in CEO positions that transformed a company. So the That's place of the yeah. understated leader has not been studied and applauded nearly as much as it needs to be. It's interesting, and I can relate to that in terms of I've always been told by many, I say we mm -hmm. all the time, mm -hmm. even at times when it really is I. Maybe I was the one who accomplished that. I was the one who you know made that happen, right. and there was nobody else involved. I still say we, and mm -hmm. I've had many people say, Jim, no, no, no. That's an I moment. You need to learn to say I and not always make it we. I'm so we-based yeah. uh, as that understated mm -hmm. leader, thinking about the we. Well, and I don't know if you've noticed that my signature on my emails, my letters and everything yeah. is fraternally. Yes. Okay? Yes. And I started that in my 20s, back when I was working in civil rights initiatives. And I came to realize that someplace I'm a brother to every yeah, human being right. on earth. We may have a lot of political differences, ideological differences, cultural differences, but there is a common denominator that we're all brothers down deep under the skin. And so that has been my little way of, over the years, holding up my hand and saying, hey, let's look for brotherhood. Right. Let's, let's look for community wherever we can right. because there are a lot of things that are tearing community apart. Looking for things that are building community and strengthening community are moments, are, are, are movements and activities uh, that we need to capitalize on. It's a beautiful way to you know, live and a beautiful way to approach things. And I think it's uh, people realizing that that is part of who you are and your mm -hmm. approach is just a benefit for them. So when you come in and you work with them, you're looking for that commonality to bring mm -hmm. people together and keep things balanced. Really an honor and a pleasure, well, Doctor, for joining us on Close Up Television. Again, wish you continued success and, and looking to forward you. to uh, chatting with you again real soon. All right. Great. Go be that understated leader that you're, you've been fashioned to be. <laughs> Absolutely. Rah, rah, rah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Thank you. To learn more and connect with Dr. Mike Armour, SLD International, and Leader Perfect Resources and Solutions, visit this website. For close-up television and radio, I'm Jim Masters. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next time.